I invite you again this morning to turn to John chapter 10, and we're looking at this marvelous chapter about Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Jesus is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. God came to the earth and walked among us, looked like us did what humans did. It was no mirage. Jesus was 100% humanity while he maintained 100% deity. If you know about Jesus, you know that he did not begin at Bethlehem as a baby in a manger. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. He is none other than the pre-existent God of the universe, according to Colossians 1.15, the one who sustains all things by the word of his power, according to John 1.1, the one who created all things. Nothing came into being which has come into being except what Jesus Christ himself brought into existence. There's no comparison to the incarnation the enfleshment of God. There's nothing you could compare it to. There's no analogy for it. There's no fit picture or illustration. What does it mean for the infinite God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, to take on human form? That is a matter of infinite condescension. It is a self-emptying humility that no one else could ever do. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the God-man, is unique. There is no one like him. There have been implications of the deity of Christ here in John chapter 10. Jesus has used that familiar phrase, I am, to describe himself. He said he, he is the door of the sheep. He also said, I am the good shepherd, The only way to God and the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34 promises about God himself coming and shepherding his people are implicit declarations from the lips of Jesus that he is in fact Yahweh in the flesh. And yet John chapter 10 will bring to a climax in a very dramatic fashion a very clear non-implicit declaration that Jesus is in fact God in the midst of his people. Before we get there, we have this response to Jesus in John 10, 19 to 21. In John uh, 10, 19 to 21, our text for this morning, we have a division concerning Jesus. And the division, frankly, is about Jesus' identity. Because if Jesus is God in the flesh, then every miracle he performs is perfectly explainable. In fact, not a surprise at all. If Jesus is God in the flesh, then every word he utters would be not controversial, but must be surrendered to immediately. But the fact that Jesus is misidentified and misunderstood by the people he came for leads to a division about what he does and what he says. I want to read to you this morning from J.I. Packer's work, Knowing God, in his section on the Incarnation. And this is something of a long quote. I don't know anyone says it better. Packer says this, The really staggering Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth was God-made man, that the second person of the Godhead became the second man, 1 Corinthians 15, 47, determining human destiny, the second representative head of the race, and that he took humanity without loss of deity, so that Jesus of Nazareth was as truly and fully divine as he was human. The word became flesh, John 1, 14. God became man. The divine son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wiggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and to talk like any other child. There was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. 
And the more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the Incarnation. This is the real stumbling block of Christianity. It is here that Jews, Muslims, Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, and many of those who feel the difficulties concerning the virgin birth, the miracles, the atonement, and the resurrection have come to grief. It is from misbelief, or at least inadequate belief, about the incarnation that difficulties at other points in the gospel story usually spring. But once the incarnation is grasped as reality, these other difficulties dissolve. If Jesus had been no more than a very remarkable godly man, the difficulties in believing what the New Testament tells us about his life and work would be truly mountainous. But if Jesus was the same person as the eternal word, the Father's agent in creation, through whom also he made the worlds, Hebrews 1-2. It is no wonder if fresh acts of created power marked his coming into the world, and his life in it, and his exit from it. It is not strange that he, the author of life, should rise from the dead. If he was truly son of God, it is much more startling that he should die than that he should rise again. And if the immortal Son of God did really submit to taste death, it is not strange that such a death should have saving significance for a doomed race. Once we grant that Jesus was divine, it becomes unreasonable to find difficulty in any of this. It is all of a piece and hangs together completely. The incarnation is in itself an unfathomable mystery, but it makes sense of everything else the New Testament contains. End quote. And Packer is right. As you're sitting here listening this morning to a message about Jesus, what is your starting point? Is Jesus a man, a good teacher, a moral example, some historical figure, or a curse word? Or is Jesus the Christ, God in the flesh? This changes everything. The dispute arose among Jesus precisely around a misunderstanding of who he was. Jesus' healing of the blind man in John 9 and his explanation of that healing in John chapter 10 provoked divergent perspectives among the people. Let's read together these three verses, John 10 verses 19 to 21. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? What we find here is a schism, a division over Jesus amongst the people. This is what verse 19 says. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. The word division here in verse 19 is the Greek word schism. That is, something about Jesus here has created a polarization. There are people on one side of things, people on another side of things. And the more people see of Jesus, the more impossible it becomes to remain neutral or to remain indifferent about him. Notice in verse 19, a division occurred again. This is not the first time. This is not the first time in the Gospel of John that we see a division of opinion about Jesus. Turn back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, interestingly, follows one of the great sign miracles that Jesus performed, the feeding of the 5,000. And in chapter 7, verses 12 and 13... We read, there was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. That's not quite right, is it? Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet, no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. And you remember in John's vocabulary, the word Jews is not an ethnic slur here. It is a description primarily of the anti-God religious establishment leaders and sometimes includes the nation of the people that are following the bad religious leadership. It is a pejorative. It's a negative term in the Gospel of John, but it reflects those Jews who are still in unbelief. And so there is grumbling about Jesus in John 7. 
In fact, from the beginning of John chapter 7 through chapter 10, Jesus is an enigma. Every miracle, every encounter with the crowd, every speech produces discussion and division. Look at chapter 7, verse 40. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, they were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Still inadequate. Others were saying, this is the Messiah. Still others were saying, surely the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is he? And there was confusion. And in fact, this conversation goes on in chapter 7. The scriptures declare that Christ comes from the descendant of David, were from Bethlehem, the village where David was. They picked up on Micah 5.2, and they knew where Messiah should come. And yet, verse 43, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some wanted to seize him, that is, arrest him and hand him over to the officials, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said, Why did you not bring him? The officers said, Never has a man spoken this way. The Pharisees said, You've not been led astray by him too, have you? No one of the rulers or the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? Not quite a true statement. Doesn't matter anyway. All the famous people agree with us. All the important people agree with us. But this crowd, verse 49, which does not know the law, they're accursed. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who came to him, being one of them, said, Our law doesn't judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? And they answered, You're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see, no prophet arises out of Galilee. This division and discussion about Jesus has been going on. The background noise is debate and schism and division. It's interesting that the religious leadership doesn't engage messianic credentials. They don't talk facts. In fact, they have to close their eyes to what is obvious before them, and they result to name-calling. Galilean. And in the context we're looking at today, satanic. The hard-heartedness is stark. John says in John 10, 19, this division occurs among the Jews. I believe here he's referring to not only the leaders, but the nation as it follows them. In chapter 7, verse 43, it was the crowd divided. In 9, 16, it was the Pharisees who were divided. And here John seems to refer to the leaders and the people. And the division happens, according to verse 19, because of these words. Which words? The the words we've been working through here in John 10. Jesus healed a man born blind in John 9, and then he turns and addresses the Pharisees. Jesus addresses the religious leaders who were frauds and hypocrites from whom Jesus went to rescue one of his own sheep, and he tells them what he just did. I pulled out one of my sheep from you to bring them to life. And because of these words, the John 10 explanation of Jesus being the good shepherd coming to get his sheep, Jesus being the only door of the sheep, Jesus being the one who had authority over death and life, these words were offensive. Jesus clearly healed a man that had been born blind. He made exclusive claims, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. And then he made the explosive claims we looked at last week that he was on a mission to the Gentiles and he had authority over death and over life itself. And what's shocking to witness here at the middle of John 10 is a negative attitude about things that are so good. I mean, Jesus is good, and what he says is so good, and what he does is good. Whether the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6 or the healing of the man born blind in John 9, it is the good things that Jesus does that provoke awe or hostility. His very good works are polarizing. And then it is the good words that he speaks that incite division. And often it is the explanation of the miracles that irritates those who witness the miracles. You remember this from John chapter 6. Jesus fed the 5,000, and of course it was 5,000 men. It was many more who were gathered there. And the idea that some people got from that important event was that, hey, this guy provides a free lunch. Let's make him king. Hold an election or a revolt. 
right now. And Jesus escaped them. He went away from them, sensing their desires, to a mountain alone by himself to pray. Jesus was not going to ride the wave of their esteeming him as popular and followable because he gave them stuff and made their life a little easier. The point of Jesus feeding them food that he created out of nothing on the spot was a demonstration, a sign, a pointer to his true identity. This is God who gave the people manna out of the wilderness. This is God who creates things out of nothing, and this is God who will care for his people. The point was not to make a king who can give you a free lunch every week. The point was to surrender to Messiah, who is God in the flesh. And when Jesus started to say at the end of John 6, unless you eat of my flesh, you have no part. People walked away. All of a sudden, the message of the explanation of the miracle got difficult. And it's all or nothing with Christ. You you don't get an indifference toward Christ and a little bit happier life by a free lunch. And when you get to the miracle in John 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. Clearly a creative act by one who is God in the flesh and meets messianic credentials. And everybody watching on should say, I want to be friends with that guy. I want to be on his team. Instead. The miracle is upsetting, and the explanation is an indictment. And so people reject. And what happens when you fast forward in the next chapter, John chapter 11? Jesus raises Lazarus from the tomb, and it is an unmistakable miracle. Nobody could deny it. Why? Because Lazarus was dead four days, and then he's walking around. He is the evidence of Jesus' miracle. And so obviously the evidence of Jesus' undeniable miracle that the Pharisees set out to kill Lazarus, bury the evidence. And what should people be saying at that point? Someone who has authority over death and life? I want to belong to him. I'm mortal. But the hard hearts reject not only the miracle, but the explanation of it. Again, the miracle is troubling because somebody way more powerful than me is here, and the explanation of the miracle is troubling because it indicts me if I will not let go of my sins. That's what Jesus is doing here in John 10. The crowd dispersed after Jesus explained why he fed them. The leaders were offended at Lazarus' resurrection. Judas was offended at Jesus' gracious dealings with Mary in John 11. In Luke 7, Simon the Pharisee was offended that Jesus would forgive a woman. And we have to ask ourselves, why is offense being taken at such good work, at such gracious words? The forgiveness of sin is offensive only when we have idols in the heart. You know what an idol is? Some pagan out there in a jungle somewhere has carved something out of a stick or a stone and bows down to it. Uh, that's, a, that's a physical outward idol. And there are idol makers and idol sellers and idol purchasers and, and physical idol worshipers in our world today, all over the world in many cultures and many places. But the Bible speaks of another kind of idolatry, not a physical one, but an idolatry of the heart. And that is where the physical outward idolatry springs anyway. Idolatry of the heart is that elevation of something that I love, that I worship, that I obey, that I yield to more than or instead of the one true God. And listen, we can do this with anything. Anything can become an idol. John Calvin rightly said, the human heart is a factory producing idols all the time. We do this. Relationships can be an idol. Money and possessions can become an idol. Prestige can become an idol. The next level at work can become an idol. Some accomplishment, recognition, celebrity. You can make an idol out of family relationships. You can make an idol out of having children. You can make an idol out of any old good thing. And you can make an idol out of sinful things too. And we know we are worshiping at the altar of something other than God when we are willing to sin to get something, bad or good, 
or we're willing to sin if we don't get something bad or good. It's a great way to test drive whether something is an idol for me at the heart level. Will I complain if I don't get what I want? Uh, There's an idolatry there. Am I willing to sin, cut corners, cheat, lie, steal, whatever to get what I want? There's an idolatry there. Why? Because obedience to the Lord has taken a backseat to what I want right now. That is idolatry. And at its base, whether we're talking about a physical idolatry of a stick or stone carved out and bowed down to, or whether we're talking about personal achievement or a comfortable life or prestige or money or relationships or anything else that we sacrifice for and bow down to at the heart level, whichever kind we're talking about, it is an offense to God And robs the human of what he was made for. What a tragedy it is. To chase after emptinesses, vanities, nothings. And idols are so dumb. At the bottom, what are we worshiping when we're worshiping an idol? We're worshiping ourselves. But we've tricked ourselves into thinking it's something transcendent, something outside of us. And if I just go get it, it's going to deliver on its promises. You know, idols never deliver. They never pay out what they promise. And they make big, grandiose promises about what you'll get if you'll just bow down and worship me. And they never deliver. And we exchange the covenant-keeping That is the promise-making and promise-keeping God of the universe for lesser things, for nothings, for deceptions. Oh, the heart of man. Listen, the, the idol in the heart is threatened when the light comes, when the truth comes. When free gifts offered by God's grace come. When our self-rule is indicted. When our self-righteousness is offended. When our possessions are stripped or our comfort and health and prosperity is taken. The healing of a blind man is only offensive if idolatries of the heart are threatened. This was what was wrong with the Pharisees. And we could guess at those idols of the heart in the way they respond to the blind man. Hey, get away from us. You're desynagogued, disfellowshipped, run away. They didn't actually care for him. They set out to be spiritual leaders, self-styled shepherds of God's people, but the people most vulnerable and the ones in need that couldn't give them anything in return had to be shunned. We could guess at their motives in John 9. We don't have to guess when we get to John 11. After the resurrection of Lazarus, their motive is out, right on their sleeve. If we let Jesus go on doing things like this, all men will believe in him. Well, wouldn't that be good if he's God in the flesh and if he's Messiah and if he actually raises the dead? Shouldn't that be what we're preaching? Shouldn't they have been the best evangelists knowing the Old Testament and being eyewitnesses to his coming? No. If he goes on like this, people will believe in him. The Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. They were concerned about a job, a temporal position, their prestige, their power, Their ability to put people under their thumb and make the most vulnerable pay out to fund their lavish lifestyles. All of which would go away in a second. What awful things they worshipped. Wouldn't we all be glad if we'd seen some miraculous healing or the raising of the dead or the masses cared for or the downtrodden lifted up? Not if good works like that threatened our position. When Jesus comes onto the scene, he upends and he offends our idolatries. It's like turning over the tables in the temple. Precisely because he is good. Precisely because he's good. 
How dreadful is this human condition of ours that we reject goodness in order to keep a tight grip on wickedness, that we would reject life so that we can hold on to what kills us, to love darkness rather than light. Jesus came to expose the human condition. And those that see it and turn from it and turn to him, they get broken things healed. Life exchanged for death. Sight traded for blindness. But those who reject the exposure become hostile to the light. Listen to Luke 12, 51. Jesus said, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you, no, I came to grant division. From now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother, daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Division would happen. Because Jesus is good and he came. The problem, of course, is not with Jesus. Jesus' person, his miracles, his words, especially his death on a cross, bring division. Necessarily so. A decision about him is forced by the audacity and sublimity of his claims. By audacious, I mean, it would be brazen and reckless and rude if Jesus were a mere man and said what he said. But sublime, what Jesus says and what he does are immeasurably immeasurably great. They're out of this world wonderful if Jesus is truly God in the flesh. If Jesus is truly God in the flesh, then his apparently audacious claims are the plain truth. And if Jesus is a mere man, then he is a blasphemer, a liar, a fraud, and he is immoral for such brazen claims. This is where John 10 is going. The identity of the one who heals the blind man, who offers forgiveness of sin, who brings light and life and truth and freedom. All of it will be on display at the end of this chapter in climactic fashion. Jesus is a stumbling block. He's a scandal. Isaiah 8.14 says he would be a sanctuary, but to both houses of Israel, he would also be a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Luke 2.34 says, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. So there is this division. Christ, God in the flesh, good, he does good things and he says good words. And the response is divided. Let's look at the two responses provoked here in John chapter 10. The first response is this. Jesus, a raving demoniac, is not credible. Look at verse 20. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he is insane. Why do you listen to him? And verses 20 and 21, grammatically speaking, are background to what's said in verse 19. That is, the conversation's been happening. What's been going on since the healing of the blind man in John 9, this running dialogue, the background noise of a polarized discussion amongst the leaders and the people of Israel, wavering opinions, people picking sides, schism, division. One side proposed that Jesus was empowered by satanic forces, He's demon-possessed and therefore raving mad, insane. In the Gospel of John, the only times the word demon is used is when the Jews are accusing Jesus of having a demon or Jesus defending himself. When the Pharisees could not discredit the miracle, they had to discredit the miracle worker. See, the healing proves he actually had power and power of a kind they could not touch. What kind of power was this? Otherworldly for sure. Is this Satan's power or God's power? And how tragic it is that the Son of God, in their minds, was labeled a demoniac. How tragic indeed that truth incarnate was labeled insane. And notice verse 20, their conclusion is, why do you listen to him? They can't give reasoned arguments. They cannot go toe-to-toe with the truth. They can't deny the miracle. They can't refute his words. They resort to name-calling and insults. And listen, Christian, don't be surprised when the truth is insulted rather than engaged. Wouldn't you just love to have conversations on the data? 
Hey, can we just look at our Bibles and see what it says? Bigot, narrow-minded, and often that's the way things go. Don't be surprised at that. They did that with our Lord. Isaiah 35, 5 says, the eyes of the blind will be opened. That is a messianic credential. And right here, Jesus opens the eyes of a man born blind. Messiah is right here. And if he's here, the reign of the Pharisees is over. That's the problem. They're not going to argue on data. They're not going to argue on facts. The reality threatens the idols of power, position, esteem, a comfortable life, control, prosperity, all that they were trying to protect. And by the way, their response here has serious consequences. If you reject the truth of Christ, you may be given over to further blindness. This is called the judicial hardening of God. That is, you reject truth plainly in front of you. God may remove your access to truth from then on. It's actually a judgment, a divine judgment to not care about the truth after you've heard it. To being given over to darkness and willful blindness. In fact, this is exactly what happens in Matthew 12 and 13. You don't have to turn there, but in the gospel of Matthew, that is the watershed moment. In Matthew chapter 12... Jesus has healed a demon-possessed man, and the leadership say, he's just removing demons by demons. He's using satanic power to do it. And Jesus says, you may not speak of the Holy Spirit's power that way. You can speak ill of the Son of Man, but don't talk about the Holy Spirit that way. And he calls it the unpardonable sin to blaspheme the Holy Spirit's work through Messiah while Messiah was on earth doing God's work and call it satanic. I don't believe you can repeat that offense. Don't worry. Somehow I I used to think, man, have I done it already? And, And is my eternal life blown? No, you cannot commit the same sin. That was unique to that time period. But that had significant consequences for the leadership in Israel at that time. In fact, when you move from Matthew 12 to Matthew 13, that is the watershed movement in Matthew's gospel. From that point on, Jesus does not speak plainly and clearly to the crowds. He speaks in parables. And his disciples pull him aside in Matthew 13 and they say, "Uh, the people aren't understanding what you're saying. Why aren't you speaking plainly anymore? And Jesus says to his followers, his immediate circle, to you it has been granted to know these mysteries. In other words, the religious leadership, when they ascribed Jesus' work to Satan, the response of God in that moment, the response of Christ in that moment, is a divine judicial hardening. You're not getting plain truth anymore. It will actually be concealed from you. So for the Pharisees here in John 10 to be ascribing to Jesus demonic power, that is dangerous territory. There's a second response on display in this chapter. It's in verse 21. And the response is this, Jesus, merciful and powerful, just might be credible. They're seeing something different in the activities of Jesus, the things he's actually doing and the words that he speaks. We, maybe we ought to listen to him. Notice verse 21, others were saying, there's the contrast. Here's the background conversation. It's going on amongst the people since the blind man was healed. And remember the astonishment. They said, no one since the beginning of the world has ever heard of the healing of a man born blind. This is a remarkable event. And notice carefully the content of this second response, a pair of affirmations, Jesus' words, and the miracle demonstrate that he is not satanic. First of all, they say the words. These are not the words of a demoniac or a demon-possessed man. Jesus' words are not incoherent. They're also not sinister. They are words of tender compassion He is a shepherd who cares for his sheep, who knows them and leads them and protects them. He is one given to selfless sacrifice. He will die on their behalf, yet he has power over death for them. These are not the words of a man driven mad by demonic oppression. They are dramatic claims, of course. Astonishing claims. Exclusive claims. 
Claims only God in the flesh could and should make. If Jesus is God in the flesh, they are for the fulfillment of prophecy, that he is truly Messiah and he is mankind's only hope. The gracious visitation of God has come. And notice what they say about his activity. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Verse 21. This question expects a negative answer. And the second perspective recognizes that Jesus' merciful, tender, compassionate, life-giving care is not at all like the activity of the demons. During Jesus' earthly ministry, the demonic activity in Palestine seems to have ramped up to, to some sort of maximal scale. There, there are demons afflicting people left and right. We shouldn't be surprised that when God the flesh is on the earth, Satan would ramp up such activities right in that location. And the activity of the demons was activity that was murderous and cruel and punishing. People were miserable under their torment. Satan is the original murderer and liar. He is the murderer of all humanity. He's the father of lies. He has been forever motivated to stamp out the creatures that bear the image of God. He is moved by menace, filled with rage and armed with deceit. He does not care a whit for the welfare of any human. To bring real healing to a suffering image bearer is beyond his horizon. He is certainly capable of otherworldly powers. Satan can do signs. He can perform miracles. During the great tribulation, miracles will be done if possible, so even to deceive the elect. Satan could make the Egyptian magicians conjure up snakes and turn water to blood. But the demons don't give life and help. They don't show mercy to the suffering. And Jesus' merciful, compassionate healing brings light and life to a suffering human. His goodness calls into question the leader's denunciations. And this second half of the crowd saying, ah, that doesn't look like demon work to me. Maybe the leaders don't know what they're talking about. This portion of the crowd offers a dissenting opinion from the Pharisees. But it's only stated negatively here. It's not a positive affirmation. It doesn't express the fullness of faith in who Christ is. Notice the perspectives that are not listed here in John 10, 19 to 21. Um, Nobody says both. Remember the multiple choice tests you used to take? You know, A or B. And then you get that one that says... A and B. Oh man, now I'm really confused. There's no A and B here, right? These are polarizing opinions. Jesus can't both be demonic and non-demonic. And nobody gives the option, it doesn't matter. If you were here on the scene in that day, you you wouldn't be removed by 2,000 years and a busy life and everything else. You're seeing these things and the witness of these events forces a decision. You couldn't be indifferent. Everything's at stake. And whether you believe this is God in the flesh, Messiah credentials, and our only hope, or he's a fraud and satanically inspired. We also don't see in this passage this perspective. Jesus is God in the flesh. I'm in a lot of trouble, and he's my only hope. I believe. Now, we did see that in John 9. The man born blind who was healed, believed, and worshipped him. We don't see that yet here in the crowd. Jesus' followers are described as sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd and his sheep hear his voice and they follow him and he gives them life. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you are a sheep. It's a good description A sheep as an animal is helpless, weak, useful, harmless, vulnerable. We as Jesus followers throughout the history of following Jesus have been those things. Helpless, weak, useful, harmless, vulnerable. Followers of Christ have been given up to lions. To be eaten alive as sport and entertainment in the Roman amphitheaters. Christians who have followed Jesus have been given up to fires, burned as torches for entertainment in Nero's garden parties, placed on piles of wood and burned throughout church history for believing the gospel. 
Christians have been given over to the sword and more recently to the gun. Christians throughout church history have been disfellowshipped, desynagogued, disowned, rejected, despised, persecuted. You may have experienced separation from family members because of faith in Christ. Maybe you've experienced the rejection from your culture. Our culture is this. Our nation is this. Our ethnicity is this religion. And if you deny this religion and choose to follow Protestantism or follow Jesus, you can no longer be our people. That goes on today, and some of you have experienced it. And for what? For what have Christians been fed to lions and burned at the stake and disowned by families? For a simple message, I have free good news for you. What a tragedy. What a glorious tragedy is that. J.C. Ryle said, the glorious gospel stirs up the corruptions of men. That's right. What is beautiful, what is excellent, what is good, what is life-giving creates division and schism. We should not be surprised if the gospel brings hostility. If gospel words, good words, sweet, kind words of life and light make enemies. To proclaim peace and truth and life. The free gift of forgiveness of sin. Do you remember sharing the gospel with others when you first got saved? Having been an enemy of God and been lost in black darkness. And been made alive by God's grace. And then you turn around to your other friends. You're like, hey, I was just in the darkness you're in. Can I, can I tell you where there's light? And they said, who are you to talk to me about darkness? How dare you? I'm just fine. And you think, how can this be? Don't they know what I've just found? Is I found the greatest treasure in the world. And I just want to tell you about it. You can't be my friend anymore. Did you experience that? And it's hard to fathom as a new believer. And the longer you live in Christ, the more you hear it, the more you see it. And the more we recognize the enslavement that the darkness of sin is. And the hardness of the human heart. And we just want the light to break through. We follow our shepherd. He heals. We bring healing. That's offensive to people convinced they need no healing. Our shepherd forgives and we proclaim his forgiveness. And it is offensive to people who are convinced they've done no wrong. He is the truth and we speak truth. But that is offensive to people who are indicted by the truth. So we trust and we follow. We might end up in the wolf's lair at Christ's behest to rescue one of his precious sheep. God may allow persecution to come into his flock, and yet his sheep are always safe and kept. You can write down Romans 8, 35 to 39. There's that great promise of no separation from the love of God. Yet we are given over every day as sheep to be slaughtered. Which is it? (laughs) Am I inseparable from the love of Christ or might I die for Christ? Yes, both. Death can't separate you from him. Sometimes it doesn't seem normal in the Christian life, 2,000 years removed, to suffer for him. We've been pretty safe from many persecutions in church history. But those will probably ramp up in days to come. You will never be forsaken, though led to slaughter. You were bought at a high price. His blood, his investment, he will keep you. We become then a fragrance of death and life, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 2. A fragrance of life to those being saved, a fragrance of death to those who are enemies of the gospel. Should we expect a world of darkness to love the light? No, John 1, 5, light shone in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. John 3, 19, light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil and they don't want those deeds to be exposed. There's the motive. The truth of God's word on any matter brings schism and strife. You open up your Bible and speak plain truth, not because it's yours or your idea, but because you represent your king and these are his words and his authority and and they actually bring life. Uh, the, The word of God is the word of liberty, the law of freedom. 
And you want others to know these things, but you could be called demonic, satanic, immoral, crazy, and foolish for it. You can quote scripture and have detractors say, well, Jesus would never, my Jesus would not. There is, of course, the liberal theology in the 20th century that wanted a sweet, gentle Jesus who never said anything controversial, never did anything supernatural. He was just a good teacher and a moral example. Nice, but not demanding. Good, but not God. Well, you can't have such a Jesus. A Jesus who makes the claims of the New Testament, who is not God, is not good. He's a liar and a fraud. He's immoral and not worth following. Can't save anyone. But if Jesus is God, then his miracles are not surprising and his words demand our very lives. You can't come and see Jesus and walk away indifferent. He demands a decision. To know him is to know God. To be found in him is to be forgiven of all your sins and to have eternal life. To be known by him is to be loved with infinite, unflinching, unfailing love and to be kept safely by his invincible arms. And you would go somewhere else. Schisms happen, divisions happen. Sometimes people who believe God's word are called schismatics. We, we hear that from church history. Protestants get the label of having protested. When truly Protestantism was a renewal of New Testament truth, a recovery of light that had been buried under darkness. In church history, schisms could happen because people defected from the truth. Sometimes schisms happen because people defect from error to another error. And sometimes a schism happens appropriately because people defect from error to the truth. Jesus said he came to make divisions. Divisions themselves are not bad. What is good is the truth and life and light in Jesus. What is bad is spiritual death and darkness of deceit. Sometimes Christ or the followers of Christ get blamed for strife in the world. You remember John Lennon's anthem, Imagine? Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries, it's not hard to do. Nothing to kill or to die for, and no religion to. Imagine all the people living in peace. Would they, John? No, of course not. The removal of borders doesn't solve the human condition. And the removal of an idea of heaven and hell is itself a satanic lie leading people to destruction. If John Lennon thinks that the claims of Jesus, if they just went away, we could all be happy. Yeah, maybe for a moment, because you could go on in the happy lie you convinced yourself of. Jesus' words are an indictment, and they bring division. But friends, they bring everything you need. Life and light and truth. A right standing with God, because God himself came to the earth and went to the cross to pay for sin for everyone who would believe. You believe in Jesus Christ today and you have all your sins, past, present, and future wiped clean once and for all. Surrender your life to Jesus and his words and you get that which brings life, not destruction. Of course, Jesus is polarizing. Of course, there are divisions and debates because of him. He is God. And the problem of all those divisions and schisms is the problem of the human heart. Christian, as we think about these things, you who have already surrendered to Christ, what remains of idolatries in your own heart? What things are you tempted to put above God in your affections or your time, your energies, your resources? Even as you did when you came to Christ, to have a view of Christ once again, to set your eyes on him, 
is to look on the one who is infinitely better than every competitor. Oh, Christian, what a waste to squirrel around, squirrel around with lesser things when we have him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good. You are good incarnate for you are God. We thank you that you did not leave us to ourselves. You did not leave us, leave us in our midnight darkness. You did not leave us to our own devices, nor in slavery to sin. But you came to earth, taking on the form of a slave, taking on our humanity, and taking our sins in your body to the cross. That you might be punished, the innocent one that we, the guilty, might go free. Lord, where would we go but to you? You have the words of eternal life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Let us even now, as we close in song together, turn our eyes to you. And not just the eyes of our heart, but all of us, yielded to you in all of your goodness. Let us never again distrust that your ways are good and the best. It's in your name we pray it. Amen.